Hello, I'm Shannon Chiesi with The Diplomat, and I'm here today at the John Hopkins School for Advanced International Studies, where I'm happy to be joining Deborah Brodigan, who is a professor of international development here at SAIS, as well as the director of the China Africa Research Initiative. Thank you so much for having me here today. It's a pleasure. As you might have guessed, uh, Professor Brodigan is going to be talking with us about China Africa relations. So, uh, easy jumping in point. We had Foreign Minister Wang Yi from China make the customary uh, beginning of year tour of Africa. Was there anything new or unusual that caught your eye in the 2015 version? You know, this is now, I think, about the 25th visit, the January visit. The Chinese Foreign Minister has been going to Africa in January. It's the first visit they do of the year and they come to Africa. And this has been going on for two and a half decades. So each year it's a little bit different. Um, they go to different countries. They sometimes try to uh, make it more symbolic. I remember in the year after the attention was really coming um, to China's engagement in Africa and people were saying they're only after resources. They kind of symbolically that next year went to a, a lot of countries that had no natural resources. <laughs> they were kind of saying, uh, we're not just here for the natural resources. But I think uh, things have been changing in the engagement. And so in that sense, it was important that he went to Sudan because the relationship with Sudan and South Sudan, the Chinese have gotten involved in something which is quite unprecedented for them in trying to uh, mediate that engagement um, and the peace negotiations there. So that was important, the Sudan uh, visit. Equatorial Guinea, I think, was interesting that they went there. That's really been more in the U.S. camp. The Chinese have been involved, but um, it's U.S. oil companies that are big in Equatorial Guinea. So that's also been of interest. But other than that, there's not much, I think, that was different about this trip. Well, let's go back to the, the Sudan portion of the visit. As you mentioned, China has been unusually active in helping mediate not just between Sudan and South Sudan, but actually between the warring factions within South Sudan, which is really unprecedented for China. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? You know, Sudan and South Sudan are a test case for the Chinese policy about non-interference in the internal affairs of other countries. This has been a core principle of Chinese foreign policy ever since 1949, since the founding of the People's Republic of China. So it's one of their five core foreign policy principles that they don't interfere. And in the past, this was always interpreted very strictly. So it's why we have a general assumption about the Chinese that they only go after business because they don't want to get involved in politics, which is very unlike the United States, for example. We are, are very um, prone to get involved in politics, to impose governance conditions, to push countries to become democratic and protect human rights. The Chinese pretty much try to stay away from all of those things. They don't want people doing that in their country, and they, they don't do it in other countries. And uh, doing something like mediation, uh, the kind of shuttle diplomacy that they've been doing in the Sudans is really new. And so it was a test case for them. And I think they're, they're finding that as they rise as a what they want to be seen as a responsible great power, doing things like shuttle diplomacy, mediation, the kinds of things that we've been involved in for a long time, they're going to be doing more and more of this. And so Sudan is an area where they've been practicing this and they've been been developing their skills in this. So it really is unprecedented. There are very few other parts of the world where we can see this kind of activity by the Chinese government. But in Sudan, uh, the first ambassador that they had appointed as a special envoy for Sudan, Liu Guijin, this was something new. And he was very successful at this. So it, it showed the Chinese back in Beijing that this kind of experiment could work, and they were able to um, weigh in on the peaceful separation, the divorce that happened, I think it was in 2011, between South Sudan when they did the referendum. They helped to or organize and facilitate that, and they helped uh, Khartoum uh, agree to let South Sudan go. Mm -hmm. So all of that was very touchy ground. The Chinese were, were deeply involved in, in making that happen in a peaceful way. Of course, they have economic interests in Sudan. You might not see them popping up in the Gambia, where <laughs> if that was to, to need a, a shuttle diplomat. Of course, we might not send a shuttle diplomat to the Gambia either. <laughs> but, um, but that is, I think, something quite unprecedented for Chinese foreign policy. And it's been very interesting to watch it develop. So do you think this is 
going to become more or less a new normal? Is this the start of a new trend or is this just a unique case given China's major interest in the Sudan and South Sudan? My vote would be that it will be the start of a trend. Um, as the Chinese have risen so quickly to a position of prominence on the global stage, a lot of other things have been evolving as well. It's not just the economic role that they have. And their political role in, in global governance, their political role at the UN, their political role in the World Health Organization, other kinds of organizations, all of these are being uh, tested in new ways. And so we can see this happening um, in the past, of course, they've been a member of the Security Council since 1971. There's been a China seat in the Security Council since, since it was founded, but it was Taiwan sitting there for, for many years uh, after the communists took over in China. So they've been at the UN, but they haven't played this. They've been pretty much focused on things within the UN. This is, is unprecedented, but it goes along with being a great power. And now they're figuring out just what that means. There's a saying in China that's attributed to Deng Xiaoping, which is that uh, they would do their economic reform crossing the river by feeling the stones, which means they would do it gradually, they would test it out, and they would see what works, and then they would move in that direction with a lot of experimentation. So I think we can see the Sudan cases crossing the river by feeling the stones in terms of this international uh, political engagement. And it is that one experiment that they're doing and they're seeing how it works. And so far it's been working pretty well. And so I do think we'll be seeing more. And I think it will probably be in areas where they can tell their constituents back in Beijing that they have an economic interest in doing this. So they won't just be doing it for the sake of, of diplomacy in general, because that's a little bit too hard for them. It's too new and too much of a change. But if they can link it to economic engagement and also to the kind of uh, stability and security relations that they uh, understand um, and have experienced at home, then I think it will fly. So yes, there will be more of this in my view. In addition to this pressure to become more politically involved, we've also seen increased pressure on China to become in involved in humanitarian efforts. And uh, the global fight against the outbreak of Ebola in West Africa has been a major case of this. Um, China has been defending its actions. Some Western country have criticized it for not doing enough. What's the sense in the actual African countries that are affected? How are they viewing China's involvement? It's not unprecedented for the Chinese to mount a, a major humanitarian response, but it's new. They, the first time they did this was after the tsunami in Southeast Asia, so that spread out from Indonesia and hit Sri Lanka. And the Chinese were very proud that uh, they sent a plane load of supplies to Sri Lanka, and it was the first international response. They got there before anybody else did. Of course, they're very close by, and, and they worked through the night to try to put that together. So, uh, and the, ultimately, the response to the tsunami ended up being 400 or 500 million dollars from the government in, in kind and in uh, various supplies and, and in just aid, cash aid. And then Chinese, the private community also contributed almost the same amount. So that was what was new. So the Ebola response, um, after the tsunami, then there was an earthquake in Pakistan. So you also saw a response, less of a response to the, the um, problems in the Philippines when they had the typhoon there. But this Ebola response is following in that pattern. So it's not been huge. It hasn't yet been as big as the tsunami response, but it's still, we haven't had a full accounting of what, of all of the, the value of what they put in there. There has been criticism, as you mentioned, from the international community, usually from the West, about the size of that response. And I think uh, I would say two things about that. One is that um, people look at the size of China's economy and the, I've seen some analyses of this when they've said, okay, as a size of the economy, the, the amount of money that's coming from the Chinese is only this big compared to the size of their economy. And whereas for Germany or the United States, compared to the size of our economies, we're doing more. And I think that's probably the wrong way to do it. It should be more as a, a on per capita basis, because yes, the Chinese have a very large economy. They also have 20% of all the people in the world. So on a per capita basis, they're not wealthy. They really are um, strictly a middle-income country. 
and uh, they're not even an upper middle income country. So they, and they have a lot of poor people in China. So mounting a very large response to something like this, putting a lot of resources into this is probably inappropriate for them, given all of the poverty that still exists in China. And they would get slammed for that back in uh, Beijing as well and from the, the Chinese netizens on the, on the internet. So they do have to be careful about putting too much money when they have um, a lot of, of significant poverty and, and problems at home. But that said, you asked about the African response, and I think it's been positive. So the Chinese have, um, uh, their response has been complementary to what we and, and other partners of the three African countries have done. They've done, they're good at construction, so they're building uh, health centers and response centers. They also have sent uh, personnel so they've sent military personnel, people that have been trained to respond to the SARS epidemic in China, people that know about contagious epidemics, um, and people who can, can go along with what they've done in the past, which is basically delivering health services. So they've had medical teams in those countries. And they've had medical teams there for a long time. This is not a new uh, program by the Chinese. But, um, so it's been more along the lines of what they've done in the past. What's actually needed there is much more of a medical systems response, and I don't think, given the, the problems and the challenges, that any, anybody's been able to respond to that yet. So that's really the direction in which we need to be going. And of course, in addition to wanting to help uh, just out of humanitarian reasons, there are actually Chinese business people, Chinese immigrants living in the affected countries. Um, you saw a mass evacuation of Chinese civilians from Libya back in 2011. Mm -hmm. And then just very recently, these protests um, in Kinshasa and the Democratic Republic of Congo, the Chinese government is very concerned about the safety of its citizens there. So how is that factor, the Chinese migrant population, affecting Chinese China's responses to crises in Africa? It really varies country by country. I don't think that the Chinese response to, um, to the Ebola epidemic was because there are Chinese living there, because they're, they're really, there are Chinese living just about everywhere these days. It's not just in Africa, of course. We have a lot of Chinese here, and Europe does. Um, one estimate is that there are 600,000 Chinese living in Japan. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Chinese diaspora is broad and, and wide and deep around the world. So, and they do have business interests all over as well. I do think it's more appropriate to view their response not just as a business response, but as a, more of a reflection of this being a, a global power and being a stakeholder in these kinds of issues, a responsible stakeholder. But nonetheless, um, there are Chinese citizens in places like Kinshasa and the DRC. In Libya, we saw a lot of Chinese working uh, on projects. There were something like 40,000 Chinese who were in Libya working on various construction projects. And they had to be evacuated. The Chinese government's concerned about this. Uh, these issues do come up as criticism of the government if they are not able to protect Chinese that are located overseas. So you can see this on internet discussions, chat groups, people wonder about why the government can't, in, in cases where they don't protect, when people are kidnapped. Mm -hmm. And this has happened when people have been shot, um, violence in, in faraway places. They are critical of the government. And the government really can't do that much. It, it's, the, it's out of their control. A lot of the people that come to work in these places don't even register at the local embassy. So they don't they don't even have a way to contact them. They don't even know how many people are actually in those countries. But it is a, um, it's a vulnerability for Beijing to have people in risky environments. And there's also a business vulnerability. In the companies that were in Libya lost um, 18 billion or more mm -hmm. from these construction contracts. They'd already put a lot out um, and brought a lot of equipment that, that was destroyed by the rebels. So these create uh, business risks. And I think the idea, when the Chinese first expanded their economic engagement in Africa, there wasn't as much attention to the risks. They didn't have good risk advisory services. They didn't have r good risk analyses. That's changing very much. And so companies that are going into places now are doing risk assessment. Uh, I was talking to someone just yesterday who had been investing in the DRC, and they said they did an uh, assessment, and they said the political risks of this are very high. And so they decided not to go forward with that investment. Mm -hmm. 
but um, this is a new area and one in which we can see the Chinese become increasingly sophisticated at judging risk. Well, thank you so much. A lot of ground to cover in a very short time. Um, fascinating subject as always. You're very welcome. And thank you for joining us. Once again, I'm Shannon Tiesi from The Diplomat.